Today we journey into the depths of Raccoon City. To check out this RPD station diorama. Vasco Toys. Action figure dioramas and props. Check out part one of this vlog series where we cut, magnetized, and constructed this diorama. The first thing that I'm going to do is base coat the dial. I'm going to do the wall portion in black and the base in a light gray. I chose granite gray by Apple Barrel to base coat this diorama base in. The final product is supposed to look like weathered cobblestone sidewalk, so that's really why I'm starting with this light gray because I'm going to weather it later on in the process. My goal in this first step is just to get full coverage of the piece. I want this gray in every nook and cranny, crack and crevice that I've carved into the base. Once the base is done, it's time to move on to the feature piece of the diorama, our wall. And for this, I opted to use some black Bayanitas. If you watched part one of this vlog series, you know that I'm using some 3D printed parts that I custom designed in this project. It's important to note that all of those pieces were sanded down and primed so that they'd be ready to receive this paint. There's a lot to this piece and I want to make sure I get full coverage so whenever I can I manipulate the dio so that I can most easily paint in all of those hard to reach areas like underneath this concrete portion. I'm not going to lie to you guys, base coating this piece is tedious. There's so many angles and nooks and crannies that I have to get into because all of this stuff is gl glued in place. That said, I mean, this is coming along nicely and uh, I think it's going to be really interesting because of all those components. Just kind of taking a while to get those base coats down. Okay, I'm in the home stretch here. After I get this portion done, I'll be finished base coating. The base and the wall are drying, so I'm going to go ahead and spray paint the two gates that we have. I'm just using a regular Rust-Oleum metallic silver on these. So now the base coats on this are completely dry. And what I think I'm going to do is hand paint the base. And I'm going to start by airbrushing the wall piece. Now, normally I would probably dry brush this. In fact, the other two RPD stations, I dry brushed the piece gray on top of black. But I kind of think that airbrushing is really the way to go with this one. And I feel like it's going to have a really good effect on it. This is the color I'm going to be airbrushing the diorama with. I've included a link to this in the description. Okay, it's confession time. I consider myself an airbrush rookie. At the time of recording this video, this is either the fifth or sixth project that I'd used an airbrush on ever. Now that I've said that, let me just say, I love using this thing now that I've figured out how to properly clean it, maintain it, and avoid some issues that are commonly associated with airbrushing. Because I'm so new at airbrushing, I don't have a spray booth in my workshop, so you see me doing this outside of my workshop with a mask on just to make sure that I'm being 100% safe. Which is today's safety first moment. If you're new to the channel, it's really important to me that other people who are starting to enjoy this hobby understand the safety measures they can take to make sure that they don't harm themselves doing something they love. Another thing that's important to me is professionalism in my artwork, and this is a commission piece, so I want this to be a professional quality piece, which means I'm going to paint even the back side of this diorama, even though it's likely not going to be seen. And in case you're wondering what my mindset is as I paint this piece, let me explain. For the first coat that we're airbrushing, I want this to be good coverage, but not complete coverage. I want some of the black that we put down on the base coat to still come through in the shadows of the piece. I feel like when I airbrush, I take somewhat of a conservative approach, putting on a little bit at a time, which prevents me from messing it up and having to redo it. For my second coat, I'm going to mix this black with the gray and spray that on. And again, that choice is really a play it safe kind of approach. I could have just used the black straight up to add some shadows and other things onto the piece, but I felt like that might be too drastic, and if I didn't like what I did here, I could always do that after the fact. It might be kind of hard to see what I'm doing here, but I'm just basically adding in a darker gray shadow to some areas of the diorama. 
I really want that color variation. I don't want this to be a single color. I feel like the screen captures I've seen from the video games show that variation. So that's really what I'm trying to achieve here in this step. I am so happy with the way this is turning out. And honestly, guys, if I had dry brushed this, I probably could have got a similar effect, but there probably would have been a little bit of signs of streaking, which there's not with the airbrushing. And it definitely would have taken a lot longer, at least for me. So I am like really pumped with this, especially because I've been new to airbrushing. And I would say this is the first project where I didn't have any major hiccups, no clogging, no issues with my pain consistency. So I'm pretty pumped about this. Remember a few seconds ago when I said I was happy I didn't dry brush? Well, I'm gonna dry brush on the dirt and grime for this and do some washes and stuff. So I am gonna dry brush, but it's gonna be much smaller areas, so it's not gonna be as time intensive. And I'm gonna use this Anita's acrylic, uh, it's earth brown, which is a color I use very frequently to start and get some of the grime along the edges of this piece and some of the areas where it would make sense to have some dirt. Whenever I dry brush or weather a piece, I always try to think about where dirt would accumulate naturally on a piece of construction like this. And in my mind, that's almost always going to be in these little crevice areas, along the areas where the columns are meeting the walls, and all of those types of things. And naturally, dirt can get kicked up from the ground, so I feel like the areas that are touching the ground are definitely spots that you want to dry brush that dirt onto, which is what I'm doing here. And this is all part of what I was discussing earlier about color variation. I want these brown hues to come through along with the different shades of gray and black that we have to establish a bunch of different color variation for visual interest. Something that my diorama mentor Al Figures always taught me is that you want to paint the areas of the diorama that are least likely to be seen as well, like the underside of this concrete area that I'm painting right now. This kind of practice speaks to the professionalism of an artist and their passion for their work. Alright guys, the next thing we're going to do is some paint wash. And this is actually just that, that same Anita's acrylic paint, the earth brown, mixed with just water. And it's very, very watered down, so it's going to be more of a subtle wash. If I have to apply more than one coat, I will do that. In case you're wondering, my washes are almost always very, very thin. You guessed it, safe approach. The recipe to this wash is super simple, literally just water and brown paint. I'm really a fan of paint subtlety, and I feel like the way I approach my washes allow me to do that. I'd rather build on subtlety than make a mistake by being a little bit too upfront and in your face with a paint wash. I also really like hitting the areas that I dry brush to get that grime with a wash to add more dirt into areas where I feel like it would accumulate. And what I'm doing here is kind of adding in some areas that I think maybe rainwater would have run down the columns. And I'm not done with this wash yet. I'm also going to use this on the base that we started in the beginning of this video. The difference here is that I want to get full coverage of the wash on this piece. I want this thing to look a little bit dirty and I feel like using the wash kind of stains the piece from that lighter gray that we had earlier to something a little bit darker, a little bit more dirty, and a little bit more gross. So I'm not exactly getting the effect that I want yet so I'm actually going to go ahead and dry brush with a different brush. This is uh, more of a round brush than a flat brush and it's a little bit bigger. Let's see if that makes a difference. So here's sort of a before and after I tested this out. So this is what I did earlier, which there's a little bit of weathering you can see, a little bit of grime. And then here's what I just did off camera to test things out. And I think you guys can probably see there's quite a bit more. And really what I'm doing is just, you know, adding that, that dirt to the areas that logically could have it. And I think it's going to make for a nice dirty effect sort of a color fade. If any of you subscribe to my friend Drip Mode's YouTube channel, you'll often see him going back and forth between washes and dry brushing just to get the highlights of the piece right. And that's really the approach that I'm taking here. 
I always kind of keep an eye on what I'm doing and if I'm not getting the exact result I want, I want to vary my approach to see if I can get where I need to be. All right, so now the dry brushing and the washes and those weathering techniques with the brown paint are behind us. And honestly, I think that this is coming out really well so far. I think that the customer is really gonna love the, those effects when he gets this piece in hand. It's time to revisit the base with paint washes again, but this time I am going to paint selective cobblestone pieces with the wash only. I'm going to use a much smaller brush head on this just so I can get a little bit more control, a little bit more detail, but really I'm just trying to darken some of the cobblestones, not all of them, and I'm going to use the brown wash first, and then I'm going to switch over to this yellow wash, using it to do the same exact thing, picking select bricks, coloring them in, so to speak, and making sure that I'm not getting too much of a harsh color on those and if I do I just wipe it away with a paper towel. To make sure this is fully dry before I do my third coat of paint washes I just run a paper towel over top of it. I want to lighten this piece up a bit but I also want it to seem dirty so I'm going to use that yellow wash again over top of the entire piece which will hopefully help me blend together all the different cobblestone collar pieces that we had done in the previous step. I really want this to seem dirty and decayed and gross and I feel like this color helps me get there. While that's drying I paint the RPD station sign white. Alright, so the next thing I'm going to do is dirty up these gates a little bit and I want to do that by airbrushing because I feel like it's going to have a more natural transition from uh, you know brown to d the metallic color that we have on here. So I'm going to airbrush these next. And this is the color that I'm going to do it with, Flat Earth by Vallejo. As I'm airbrushing this, my goal is to kind of have it be dirtiest on the bottom and work its way up, fading into the metallic color towards the top. Once I feel like those are in a good spot, I move them to the side and I actually decide that I'm going to go back to the base and I'm going to airbrush some of that as well. I also hit the wall with a little bit of the airbrush. Okay, so I think we're mostly done with the airbrush after airbrushing the gate, airbrushing the base, and some of the edging of the wall. And I really feel like this is looking a lot more like I wanted it to, a lot dirtier. I am going to do some hand painting techniques. I'm definitely not done with the gate. I want to add some darker tones with either sponge painting or dry brushing. And I'm probably also going to dry brush some darker tones on the base as well. And uh, then we're going to get working on the sign and the lighting, and then we're going to be done. For this dry brushing coat, I ended up just doing a little bit along the concrete crack lines and some of the edging of the diorama just to add in a darker tone of that earth brown that we had used earlier in the project. Then I took that same earth brown and I used it on the gate, trying to get that fade technique that I was talking about earlier, adding some detailing towards the bottom of the gate and trying to fade it up to the metallic portion of the top part of the gate. And here's a quick look at how it's looking so far after we did those paint techniques. So off camera I sprayed this with Minowax polyurethane and I let it dry for several hours and now what I'm going to do is add in some mortar between the cobblestones and I'm going to do that with this paint and patch lightweight wall spackle which I use all the time on this channel and it's a really simple process that I'm going to show you guys. I use an old gift card for this process, but you can use any sort of straight edge to spread the wall spackle all over the entire piece. I don't want any of the cracks of the cobblestones to go uncovered, and so I'm spreading them all the way across both sides of this, starting with one side, and then I'll move on to the next side. After you're satisfied, grab yourself a cloth and some water, and then just simply wipe this stuff away. Now, if you've used the Minowax polyurethane or another sealing method, this should protect the piece from wiping away your actual paint, and just wipe away the excess mortar. Okay, so now you can see we have one side that's done, and this other side that's not done yet, 
And honestly, for whatever reason, I feel like, and it's because probably because some of the paint that, although we sealed this, some of the paint gets blended when you use that, you know, water to wipe away the mortar. So that's this side. I usually do one side at a time when I can, because I learned in my carbon scoring diorama that uh, sometimes the stuff dries if you did the whole thing and only got to one side at a time. You know, if you did this side first, this side might dry a little more than you want to. So now I'm going to do this same process on this side. Now, one thing you might be thinking is that now that we did this, this mortar looks way too clean because the rest of this is dirty and looks like it's been weathered over time. So it wouldn't make sense to have the mortar be clean. So a simple fix for that is I'm going to use the same black or excuse me, brown wash that we used earlier just over top of some of those areas. And I'm not going to do it uniformly. I'm going to try to to do it in a way that um you know gives a little bit of uh a variety. And that just involves me carefully selecting spots that I want to place the wash over top of. The next thing that I wanted to do was paint the raccoon police sign that goes under the RPD sign and I tried a couple of different methods with this. I tried a regular paintbrush first. I wasn't feeling it. Then I tried these graffiti markers which I still wasn't feeling and then I went back to the paintbrush with a smaller tip and I just really was very very careful with what I was doing and I feel like that was the ticket. Once that was out of the way it was time to get this RPD station sign looking dirty and grimy and like it had been there for years. So guys, I was trying to, I designed this so that these little pegs would fit in here. Uh, but for whatever reason, it's not working. And honestly, sometimes work, you know, smarter, not harder. So what I'm going to do is glue these to this. And then I'll just mount the sign all at once. And I feel like it's going to look a lot better. So I'm going to actually hot glue this and see if that holds. And if not, I'll put some super glue. There were definitely a couple things with this sign that caused me to kind of go to my backup plan, but I'm really glad that I did because I think you'll see in the end that it worked out really well. So I preset the hot wire foam factory styro glue onto the sign, the back of the sign. But one of the things that I do sometimes if I know I want something to stick immediately, but then I also want a stronger hold over time, I'm also going to put some hot glue so that the hot glue will kind of immediately dry while then, you know, the stronger glue will hold over time. So the hot glue just kind of like is that placeholder that keeps it in place until it's actually strong enough from the other glue to, to be permanently there. And I'm just trying to make sure that I center this. And then I have a little backing piece here that is designed to support, but also keep this thing straight up and down. I don't want this tilting. You might be wondering what my plan is for the lighting on this dial. So I'm gonna have three lights on this. I'm gonna have two here, those are gonna be like white lights, and then one up here, which is gonna be a red light, which was specifically requested by the customer. And I'll show you guys, so the way this is gonna work, I have my 3D printed fixture holders and then I have these little orbs that I found on Amazon for really cheap I got a ton of them I'll show you guys a closer look at them so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to glue all this in place first I'm going to spray paint this white so it'll mimic like a white globe light and then I'm gonna drill a hole in the back of it and I have a hole in the foam that I can feed the wire from so the switches will be on the back and you won't be able to see the wires or anything like that. Um, so I'm really excited to try this. I've never done it before. I'll put the links to these orbs in the description of the video so you can check them out if you want to try them. Here's a closer look at the fixture holder. So this is a 3D print design that I had made myself that mimics what you see in the video game. This slot is where the wire is going to get fed up into from outside from the back. Then here's the orbs that I was showing you guys or talking about. These are going to sit right in here. I'm going to glue them in place. And there'll be a hole in the back here. And that's what is going to feed uh, the LED right into the, to the light. 
Because these are spheres, I'm spraying them lightly, but to stop them from moving, I have them placed in some 3D print failures, and I'm just lightly going over them so I get full coverage, but I don't get too much coverage. So here's what the light fixture is going to look like now that the paint the paint is dried. So what I'm going to do is just use this Dremel to drill a hole in the, in the back side of it. If you don't have a Dremel and you're looking for a good one, I highly recommend the Ryobi One Plus One that I use. It made drilling these holes extremely easy and just took a matter of seconds. So you guys can see there's the little hole that I drilled in there. And I'm going to go ahead and pop this off. Once that's done, all I have to do is thread the LED wired lighting through the hole that I created with the Dremel so that I'll be able to push it through the wall area and then ultimately wire the lighting which I will cover in part three of this vlog series. But before I do that I need to mount these to the wall so first I'm mounting the fixtures using hot glue being very careful not to cover the area that I need the wire to travel through on the 3D print. Then I turn back to one of my favorites, Hot Wire Foam Factory Styro Goo, to glue the orbs into place on top of the fixtures. Thanks so much for watching this episode where I show you my paint process and some of my finishing techniques on this RPD station. If you guys want to find out how I'm going to wire the lighting for these, please tune in to the next part where I'm going to cover that I'm going to cover power supplies and wired LED lights. Thanks, guys. I'll see you in the next episode.